The Carthaginian Empire was a powerhouse spreading across North Africa, Spain, the Balearic Islands, Sardinia, and Corsica. Though technically an amalgamation of Phoenician city-states and only informally an empire with the city-state of Carthage at the helm, this was the one rival that could truly send a shiver down Roman spines. Up to this point, Roman Carthage had been formal friends. They had established alliances, commercial ties, and mutual enemies even. But when the Roman Republic began to consider taking Sicily for itself, there quickly came to light one inevitable consequence. The Romans would have to fight off the Carthaginian Empire. Nonetheless, after a domino effect of events, such a consequence would come whether Rome wanted it to or not. In 288 BC, a group of mercenaries referred to as the Mamertines began to occupy the Sicilian city of Messana. After conquering the town, the Mamertines quickly became uncomfortable with their surroundings and reached out to both Rome and Carthage in hopes of gaining some degree of protection by 265 BC. At first, only Carthage came to their aid and agreed to assist the Mamertines, particularly against Syracuse if a Carthaginian garrison could be set up in Messana. This was a fair deal to the mercenaries, and so they accepted the terms. Rome by this point had not been extensively interested in Sicily, although a debate came about as to whether they should come to the aid of the Mamertines, who were fellow Italians. Still, the Roman Senate was torn between those who felt that the Mamertines had wrongly stolen Messana and did not deserve their protection, versus the rest who saw the potential selfish benefits of entering Sicily. After a general assembly decided to support the arguments of the latter, although worried about the potential reaction of Carthage, Rome unwaveringly gathered the necessary men under the command of Appius Claudius Caudex and set off to establish a garrison of its own in Messana. Whether there would have been a conflict simply from the Roman arrival or not is a question that would never be answered, because instead, the Mamertines reacted to the news of the coming Roman garrison by urging the Carthaginians to leave. Carthage was deeply displeased and offended by this request, as they had already come to the Mamertines' aid and were now being forced out simply to be replaced by Rome in retaliation. The Carthaginians decided to form a new alliance with Syracuse, Holding nothing back, this new coalition besieged Messina as the Romans arrived in Sicily. The war began immediately. As the Romans neared the city, Anno, the Carthaginian commander, warned his empire's former allies that they soon would not even be able to wash their hands in the sea. Not expecting such an aggressive response so quickly, the Romans offered a peace deal to Anno. But this was immediately rejected. Nonetheless, the Romans could not be swayed by Carthage or even Syracuse. There is debate as to whether the Syracusans and Carthaginians voluntarily withdrew or if the Romans swiftly defeated them. But regardless, the siege was ended upon the Roman arrival to Messana and still, the Romans could, in fact, wash their hands in the sea. The next move for the Romans, who now understood the real and imminent threats that would be posed by allowing Carthage to continue its expansion throughout Sicily, was to deal with Syracuse. Another commander, Manius Valerius Maximus Messala, took some of the Roman troops up to Syracuse and ambushed the city. Unable to defend themselves and unwilling to wait for Carthaginian assistance, Syracuse surrendered and agreed to align with the Romans and abandoned Carthage. A few surrounding cities followed suit, now fearing the potential backlash if they refused. Although the war would scarcely be fought on land, the Romans were quick to besiege the Carthaginian ally of Acragas. When the Carthaginians attempted to come to the rescue of their friend and lift the siege, they too were put down by the Romans and the city was sacked. This infuriated Carthage and began a back-and-forth contest of taking and losing cities between the two sides, although the focus of warfare began to take a shift toward the sea. Initially, the Carthaginians had a superior naval force and more experience with such conflict. The Romans, however, were unfazed by this and understood that in order to win the war, they would have to establish a navy of their own. 
In a streak of good luck, a Carthaginian warship was spotted on low tide by the Romans, who captured the vessel and likely utilized it to create copies for their new naval force, with some innovative additions. One of these upgrades made by the Romans was the Corvus which was essentially a bridge that could be moved in any direction and utilized to lower infantry troops from the superior Roman army onto the Carthaginian ships. This addition proved to be greatly beneficial for the Romans and helps to give them the upper hand throughout the naval warfare. Not many details of the series of raids and skirmishes have been maintained over the years, but it seems clear that the first few years of the conflict were more or less a stalemate, with now Rome and Carthage fairly equal at sea and a slight advantage for the Romans on land, though not many land battles were fought. Aiming to grab the high ground in some form, the Romans now look to Africa, Carthage's home soil. Four legions under the command of Marcus Regulus Attilius arrived in modern-day Tunisia as the First Punic War raged on overseas. Oddly, the Senate quickly called for the withdrawal of two of the legions, but the rest remained in Africa and quickly occupied the city of Tunis in 255 BC as negotiations continued to fail. The Carthaginians were far from giving up nonetheless, and one of their commanders, a Spartan by the name of Xanthippus, returned with a 16,000-strong army and routed the Romans in Africa. Only 2,000 of the Roman troops survived to flee, but they too perished on their way out as a storm at sea wrecked the fleet of nearly 100,000 men who had rescued them on the journey home. The following year, the war would resume back in Sicily once more. The Romans continued to gain territory and push the Carthaginians further and further out, although when they attempted to return to Africa, their ships were again destroyed at sea, keeping the Carthaginian homeland safe. In Sicily, the hopes of Carthage remained a risk, but the war was far from over. Despite consistent victories, Rome was yet to seize and hold all of Sicily. The war was draining both sides, and there seemed to be no end in sight. As the city of Lilibium refused to fall to the Romans despite valiant efforts to take it, the Battle of Drapana brought about a remarkable Carthaginian victory at sea. And with momentum in their favor, the Carthaginians beat down the Romans once again in the Battle of Phintius shortly after, bringing about a long break in a significant naval conflict. Nonetheless, following these battles in 249 BC, Carthage had lost all of its Sicilian holdings aside from Lilibium and Drapana. As the Romans battered the city walls in desperate attempts to finally free the island of Carthage's grip, the Carthaginian commander, Hamilcar Barca, ambushed the enemy using repeated guerrilla attacks. Despite temporarily capturing Eryx, Barca was not able to do much given the depleted state of a Carthaginian army. Having failed to garner monetary support from Egypt as they had hoped, the Carthaginians were close to having no choice but to surrender. Whether they knew this or not, the Romans decided that this would be the time to attack by sea once more. In 242 BC, Gaius Lutatius Catulus led a 200-ship fleet back to Sicily and straight to Drapana. By the next spring, the Carthaginians would collapse under the Roman bombardment. Nearly broke and exhausted from the years of war, Carthage was ready to call it quits and entered into serious peace negotiations for the final time. The Treaty of Lutatius would, at last, bring an end to the First Punic War. Under its terms, the Carthaginians were required to withdraw entirely from Sicily and additionally had to pay a significant sum of 3,200 talents in indemnity over the next decade. After 23 years of war that had battered both parties remarkably, the Romans had finally triumphed and proved once again, although the Roman Republic may stumble, it would not yet fall. Despite first having no solid plans to take Sicily and hefty concerns about even considering such a campaign, by the end of it all, Rome had taken Sicily and not even the Carthaginian Empire could stop it.
The overall aftermath was rough for the losing side. Shortly following the resolution of the conflict, Carthage had attempted to withhold funds from some of the foreigners they had enlisted in the war, which led to a fairly disastrous revolt. For the most part, the rebels were eventually put down, but in the meantime, Rome managed to seize Sardinia and Corsica from Carthage, which the latter wanted back. By 237 BC, they were ready to launch a campaign to actually go recover them, but Rome was not going to allow that. They immediately deemed this as an act of war, and with Carthage still recovering from the decades-long conflict they had just gotten out of, this quickly put a stop to their endeavor. Rome managed to strong-arm their foe into not only giving up Sardinia, but also Corsica, in addition to a 1,200 talent payment. Despite agreeing, Carthage was furious with their Roman bullies, and many within the empire became radicalized. One of these men was Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar was a famed and seasoned military leader on the side of Carthage. His forgiveness would never come, and until his last breath, it would be his biggest dream to get revenge for Carthage's loss in the First Punic War. But this would not be possible on such short notice, as Carthage still needed to refuel and revive itself from the first conflict, followed by the rebellion. So for now, Hamilcar looked to the Iberian Peninsula, not Italy. Carthage had already found success with their Phoenician colonies in Spain, and the mass amounts of resources in the form of silver. So it seems the most logical to have Hamilcar go there to expand Carthaginian influence and claim. Upon doing so, he initially established himself in Cadiz and branched out from there. Over time, Hamilcar's army grew as he did his control of the region on behalf of Carthage. But in 229 BC, the great general drowned before ever having a chance to leave Iberia and seek the revenge he so badly wanted. Nonetheless, Hamilcar Barca had a son by the name of Hannibal, and he had raised his young boy with a burning passion and hatred for Rome, just as he himself maintained. This ensured that even after Hamilcar's death, Carthage would remain staunch enemies of the Roman Republic. In the wake of Hamilcar's absence, a man by the name of Hasdrubal the Fair would take over leadership in Carthage's Iberian possessions, which by now covered roughly half of the peninsula with an ever-growing army. By 226 BC, Rome was becoming somewhat anxious about the success that their foe was having over in Iberia. And so a treaty was signed on the agreement of Hasdrubal, which stated that Carthage would not expand into the south past River Ebro in Spain. And Hasdrubal meant what he said, but Hannibal, on the other hand, did not intend to follow such an agreement. After all, his father had taught him too well for such a thing. Only a few years after negotiations between Rome and Carthage, Hannibal took control of Spain after Hasdrubal was killed and almost immediately began to push beyond the current borders. The final straw for Rome would be when Hannibal captured Saguntum in 219 BC, stripping the Republic of one of their longtime allies in the region. Rome was deeply annoyed by this, and thinking that Hannibal couldn't be too hard to defeat, declared war by the spring of 218 BC. As Rome was gearing up for war with the new young gun of Carthage, Hannibal was cooking up his own plan, and he wasn't just an average general. He had learned quite a bit about Rome over the years, and he realized that the Republic had a good record of defeating opponents outside of Italy, but maybe not inside. If the Romans went after Hannibal in Spain, he might lose. But if he went after them in Italy, he might win. As a result, the young general left his brother in charge of their holdings with an army of his own, while Hannibal led the rest of their troops across the Alps in a matter of days. Although it would only take 15 days, Hannibal and his men faced more resistance than they had expected to as they marched towards Italy. The local Gallic tribes didn't take kindly to these intruders, and by the time the Carthaginians had finished their journey, over half of the troops had either been killed 
injured or deserted. Luckily for Hannibal, though, some of the locals in Italy were deeply unsatisfied with Roman rule and began to join the Carthaginian cause. As this new coalition marched on, Hannibal found success in multiple early skirmishes, like the Battle of Ticinus, the Battle of the Trebia, and the Battle of Lake Trasimene. The Romans had been taken aback by the developing situation, given that they had expected to go and fight Hannibal in the Iberian Peninsula, not on their own turf. But here he was, and the threat could not be ignored. So far, the Carthaginian general had been proven right. The Romans were looking weak on their own soil, and Hannibal had even managed to build up his army thanks to the locals. His confidence was on the rise, and it would get an even bigger boost in the summer of 216 BC when both sides met at Cannae. Earlier that year, Hannibal had captured a crucial supply depot in the town, which was disastrous for the Romans, and furthermore concerns them that the invader would soon take control of the entire city. As a result, the Romans decided to resolve the situation via combat. The first clash between the Romans, under the command of Consul Varro, and the Carthaginians was only a minor skirmish after the latter had ambushed the Romans on the way to Cannae. As the battle eventually played out along the river Aufidus, Hannibal would yet again crush the hometown Roman troops, sustaining fairly minimal casualties himself. This victory triggered a wave of support, with city-states all throughout southern Italy pledging loyalty to the Carthaginian side. And although this was a great achievement, Hannibal still found himself in a new predicament. He had no reinforcements. If he was to continue and head straight for Rome itself, he'd have to do it without any backup, as his brother was held up back in Spain and no one could assist from Carthage. Rome, however, had adopted a new policy of essentially avoiding Hannibal entirely. They enacted the Fabian policy, which planned for the Romans to focus on defeating the Allies and blocking resources of the Carthaginians to first cripple Hannibal's forces. And as the latter's advantage seemed to be slipping away, Rome refused to accept any negotiations for peace. While Hannibal scrambled to retain control over his captured Italian territories, the Romans would attack wherever he wasn't. The Carthaginian offensive was beginning to fall apart. They failed to take Sardinia back, their authority was constantly being challenged, and no one was being sent to assist. By 207 BC, all Hannibal had left was Brutium. The Romans were now controlling the seas to cut off the Carthaginians from help or supply, and back in Spain, Hasdrubal had been beaten down and lost control, while a new wave of Carthage Italian allies were instead turning to Rome with their loyalty. Running on their building momentum, the Romans next moved to Africa to give Hannibal a taste of his own medicine. As Hannibal continued his struggle in Italy, the Romans, now under the command of Consul Scipio, invaded Africa in 204 BC and began to wreak havoc. Their Numidian allies joined them while the Carthaginians prepared to send troops back home under Gizgo to fight off the problematic Romans. Upon arrival, they were joined by their own Numidian ally in the form of Prince Syphax and his troops. This coalition eventually clashed with the Roman invaders and luck was not on Carthage's side. The Romans were victorious, and having now captured enough territory, including Tunis, to make Hannibal himself fear that the worst was yet to come for the city of Carthage, the Carthaginians were becoming desperate. Hannibal subsequently returned from Italy as negotiations occurred, but provided nothing between Rome and Carthage. His arrival in 202 BC would bring about the dramatic end to the Second Punic War. As autumn rolled around, Hannibal and Scipio were ready to come face to face, literally. The opposing generals met personally at a plane near Naragara. It's unknown exactly what was said, but if any attempts had been made at ending the war through diplomacy, they failed miserably. 
with 35,000 and 40,000 infantry and 6,000 and 4,000 cavalry respectively for Rome and Carthage, the armies were ready for the final spectacle. In addition to his men, Hannibal also had 80 war elephants, but these proved to be a detriment instead of an aid. The Romans managed to dodge the initial carnage of the animals before scaring them back towards the Carthaginians, creating a chaotic scramble that allows the Roman forces to swoop in and decimate Hannibal's left wing despite their best efforts to fight back. The Roman left wing then attacked Carthaginian's right flank, while the centers of both, led by Scipio and Hannibal themselves, marched toward each other. As this clash raged on, the Roman cavalry were destroying their Carthaginian counterpart before charging at Hannibal's center from the rear while the Roman center had them trapped from the front. This was it. This was the end of the Second Punic War, and just as those before him had done, Hannibal failed to defeat the mighty Romans. Though Hannibal would manage to escape, there was no more hope for Carthage to compete with their opponent. The Carthaginian government was forced to sue for peace and sign a treaty that would essentially bankrupt the once formidable adversary of the Romans. And now, Carthage was no longer allowed to declare war without the consent of Rome. They were also required to give up their naval fleet, altogether crushing any prospects of Carthage remaining a dominant military power as they had been. So, in spite of early wins and the leadership of the renowned Hannibal, Carthage lost, and it seemed that still, Rome was truly invincible. While the First Punic War lit the fire of aggression between the dueling powers, it was the Second Punic War that would secure the hatred both sides had for each, and ensure that Rome, after back-to-back -back victories, would remain the superior entity. But more was to come. Carthage had been drastically weakened and crippled by the most recent war and peace treaty, but it nevertheless still existed. And this bothered one too many Romans. After Rome's triumph in the Second Punic War, Carthage had a steep price to pay in talents, land, and military autonomy. Possibly one of the most significant restrictions that Rome had now placed on Carthage was the agreement that Carthage was unable to wage war in any form without the permission of the Roman Republic. And this even included defensive wars. Massinissa, a contemporary Numidian king and ally to Rome, would take full advantage of this deal between Rome and Carthage, as the Numidians were looking to expand, and their neighbors in Carthage had some territory to spare. Over the span of a few decades, Massinissa was slowly chipping away at Carthaginian holdings, and whenever his victims appealed to Rome, desperate to declare war back and defend their cities, the Romans refused and instead supported the Numidians. For a stunning amount of time, the beaten down Carthaginians actually obeyed this demand and refrained from military action. But this would eventually change. In 151 BC, Carthage had had enough. Under attack yet again from the Numidians, the contemporary Carthaginian general Hasdrubal the Boat Harch mobilized a significant army and launched a counteroffensive. Although Carthage would ultimately lose the conflict and Hasdrubal would be sentenced to death for his breach of the treaty with Rome, the latter was far from forgiving when it came to the Carthaginians. Instead of recognizing the stagnant military weakness of Carthage, an important handful of Roman senators insisted now more than ever that Carthage posed a threat to the Roman Republic, and therefore must be destroyed. No one knows exactly why the Senate soon decided that war with Carthage was best. Some attributed to greed, others to the threat of commercial competition, or potentially even a fear of political rivalry. Theories abound, and none have been proven as fact, but we do know the opinions of a couple Roman senators who spared over the matter for some time. 
one by the name of Scipio Nazica, argued that Carthage must remain intact. Even if weakened, the constant looming possibility of a threat from Carthage could be used by Roman officials to keep the Republic united and the people under better control. On the flip side, and the eventual winning side, was Cato. Remembered for his strong anti-Carthage sentiments, Cato believed that Carthage must be destroyed, and the matter was that simple. With the indemnity paid off and its economy growing, Carthage had made itself appear even more threatening to those who wished to convince the Romans that it really was. And with the unapproved military action against the Numidians, the Carthaginians were nearly handing the Romans reasons to declare war. Still, there were attempts made by Carthage to de-escalate through diplomacy once word got out of the Roman senators' ambitions. It was too late for negotiations, though. Cato's faction had won the debate, and Rome knew what Rome wanted. The downfall of the Carthaginians. In 149 BC, a massive Roman army led by co-consuls Manius Manilius and Lucius Calpurnius Piso landed at the port city of Utica, not far from Carthage itself. It had already been decided by Rome that war was inevitable, but the Carthaginians were determined to save their city through diplomacy and subsequently sent an embassy to meet with the Romans and make peace. Rome reacted first by attempting to disarm the Carthaginians and, when obeyed, next demanded that the city of Carthage be abandoned and then destroyed upon the Carthaginian relocation. It was at this point that the Carthaginians had had enough and finally understood that they only had one option left. They must defend their city at all costs. Recognizing now that Rome could never be a friend, the Carthaginians released the condemned Hasdrubal from death row and informed him that he was needed once again to defend the city of Carthage, but this time from the Romans. When the latter arrived at the city walls, they quickly understood that they would have to besiege the city as they were unable to get past the barriers. This led to a fairly slow development for the first portion of the war, as Carthage attempted to disrupt Roman supply lines and damage their ships, but only found minimal success as the invaders managed to defend themselves while trying to break through the Carthaginian defenses. Small-scale, often-on skirmishes continued into the following year, at which point Rome decided to change up its strategy a bit after the election of new consuls. Instead of continuing with such a heavy siege of Carthage, it seemed more possible to first defeat all of Carthage's friendly neighbors and then deal with the weakened city itself. This plan was only minimally successful, though. Most of the Carthaginian allies held up just fine against Roman assaults, but things changed yet again when the grandson of the great Scipio Africanus, also named Scipio, was elected consul in 147 BC in order to give him full command of the campaign. And this was just what Rome needed. Meanwhile, though, within the walls of Carthage, Hasdrubal had lost either faith in or respect for his own government and decided that the only solution was for him to take over. So, he did exactly that, overthrowing the current authorities and now controlling not only the military, but the entire city. This was just in time for Scipio's appointment as consul and meant that the remainder of the war would showcase the wit and skill of both men, face to face. Upon his appointment as consul, Scipio got right to resolving one of the main issues that the Romans were facing, and that was a plethora of poorly disciplined and motivated troops, all of which the new authorities swiftly dismissed. Those who remained were now held to a higher standard of effort and efficiency. Scipio was then focused on once and for all breaking through the city's defenses, and to this extent, he quickly found success. In the dark of the night, he and a few thousand of his men breached the city walls and forced the Carthaginian defense to flee. Nevertheless, this victory was only partial, as Scipio recognized the risks of remaining inside the city walls with such a small force and opted to withdraw before daylight broke. Both leaders were now angry for different reasons. 
Hasdrubal was furious with his defense forces for not only failing to stop the Roman advance, but then for fleeing the scene. On the other hand, Scipio was angry at the fact that Roman progress was still slow and they had failed to cut off the supply of necessities by sea into Carthage. In a show of force, Hasdrubal put on a display of torturing his Roman prisoners of war, while Scipio tried to cut Carthage off from outside help. Neither action really did much, and a full-blown battle soon broke out on the seas. The events that followed led to more Roman progress against Carthaginian troops and fortifications, but still nothing monumental, and not what Scipio wanted. It wouldn't be until 146 BC that the Roman consul would get his wish, ready to bring an end to the war. As spring rolled around, Scipio launched a new siege on the city, which this time actually worked. The Romans entered the city with rage in their hearts and destruction on their minds. Over the next week, Scipio led his men in a scorched earth rampage, massacring the citizens of Carthage and burning the city to the ground. Only 50,000 Carthaginians were spared, and only then to be taken prisoner and sold into slavery. Hasdrubal, to the disgust of his own wife who chose death instead, surrendered. Scipio agreed to let him live and not to make him a slave as would happen to the others, but that was all the Romans had to offer. Carthage was gone. Hasdrubal lost everything, and Rome got what it had wished for. The surrounding territory that had belonged to Carthage were also seized by the Romans, and it was clear by now that the Carthaginian Empire was no more. After three years, each tipping the scales further and further in favor of the Roman Republic, there would no longer be a doubt that when it came to Rome and Carthage, the latter ultimately collapsed. But while the Punic Wars were a pillar of Rome's early history, they were not all that occurred during this era. In fact, throughout the Punic Wars, the history of Rome was made up of much, much more.